Well, good afternoon, everybody, and we're going to switch to steam sterilization. Specifically, this talk is about quality control for steam sterilization. My name is Susan Flynn. I'm one of the other technical application specialists in 3M's device reprocessing business located in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this virtual conference today. Our learning objectives for this session are to review the current AMI and AORN recommended practices for quality control monitoring of steam sterilization processes. Hopefully, this will be familiar territory for most of you. On occasion, our QC monitoring indicates a problem with the sterilization cycle. That's never a good day and requires a clear head to begin an investigation. So we'll also discuss a couple of case studies and some troubleshooting tips. Let's begin by reflecting on the critical role that sterile processing personnel play by stopping the disease transmission cycle. This slide depicts the chain of infection. And of course, we've all been getting daily crash courses about person-to-person -person transmission with an airborne pathogen like the coronavirus. But let's think about the chain of infection as it pertains to instruments used during surgical procedures. Starting on the top and working clockwise, an infectious agent could be hosted in patient A, the reservoir, and a surgical procedure could provide a portal of exit for that infectious agent. Reusable surgical instruments used during the procedure can then serve as the vector, providing a mode of transmission for that pathogen to infect patient B, the susceptible host, during their procedure. The staff in sterile processing play a critical role in breaking this chain of infection. By carefully cleaning and then sterilizing or disinfecting reusable instruments, the disease transmission cycle is broken. Your work really helps prevent surgical site infections caused by inadequately reprocessed instruments. You'll recall from the Spalding classification scheme, which classifies items based on their intended use, that critical devices are defined as instruments that enter sterile tissue, including the vaccine system and reusable critical devices should be cleaned and sterilized between patients. That's because the sterilization process destroys all living organisms, including bacterial spores. As elective surgery opens up across the country, your colleagues in the OR will be preparing sterile fields prior to each procedure. ARN guidelines state that only sterile items should come in contact with the sterile field. And in their guideline for sterilization, ARN states that saturated steam is the preferred sterilant for heat and moisture stable items, unless, of course, it states otherwise in the device manufacturer's IFU. Before we talk about the details of steam sterilization, let's reflect on the reasons that the use of steam sterilization is so prevalent. Steam sterilizers are used everywhere, and that's because steam sterilization is reliable, consistent, economical, and an effective method of sterilizing reusable instruments. The technology is well understood. The items can be packaged to maintain their sterility until the time of use, and there are no chemical residues, making it safe for both staff and patients. Keep in mind that saturated steam, and by that we mean water vapor that's in a state of equilibrium between condensation and evaporation, is our sterilant. Saturated steam pressures that we see in sterilizers are shown on this screen for different temperatures. Depending on the brand of sterilizer you have, your printout might report pressure as absolute pressure, which is the steam pressure reading relative to a perfect vacuum, or as a gauge pressure, which is absolute pressure minus atmospheric pressure. And as you may recall, at sea level, atmospheric pressure is 14.7 PSI. So if your sterilizer runs a little higher than the temperature set points on the left, you might see pressures running a little higher than the values in this table. And steam under pressure is able to deliver a large amount of energy really quickly. So inside the sterilizer, when that saturated steam comes into direct contact with the load items, which are colder, 
it condenses and transfers enough latent heat or energy to kill any of the microorganisms that might still be contaminating the surface of those cleaned load items. In this picture, you'll see a picture of spores that have been obliterated by steam sterilization. So we said that as steam condenses on those surfaces, it releases energy that damages and destroys the large biochemical molecules required for life. So the proteins are denatured, the nucleic acids are damaged, and, and the spores are physically ruptured during steam sterilization. Every method of sterilization has critical variables that are required to achieve effective sterilization. I'll give you a moment to recall in your head the three critical variables required for effective steam sterilization. Okay, I'm sure you remembered that the critical variables for steam sterilization are time, temperature, and the presence of saturated steam. If any of these variables are missing, your devices may not be sterile. And while it's well understood that we need to be at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time, know that steam is equally important because steam is our sterilant. Just like Larry in the last session talked about vaporized hydrogen peroxide being the sterilant, in the case of steam sterilization, steam is our sterilant. Poor steam quality is, of course, one of the causes of sterilization process failures. An effective steam sterilization requires a supply of saturated steam of the appropriate quality, purity, and quantity to the sterilizer. But just what is good quality steam? Luckily, it's well-defined in AMI ST79, which includes quantitative provisions for each of those three attributes. With respect to steam purity, Amy cautions against adding amines to the condition of the steam lines because they can risk staining of packaged items. On the steam quantity front, you want to make sure that you've got constant steam pressure that meets the sterilizer manufacturer's minimum pressure specs available to properly operate all of your sterilizers. Steam supply systems should be designed and built to consistently meet the steam demand in your facility. And if we dig into steam quality, there are three critical variables identified. Dryness, the level of non-condensable gases, and superheat. So dryness obviously is important as wet steam can contribute to wet packs at the end of a sterilization cycle, something that nobody wants and um, will be rejected if found in the OR. ST79 specifies that steam dryness should be between 97 and 100%. Non-condensable gases entrained in the steam supply can hinder steam penetration into loads, and SD79 specifies an acceptable level of non-condensable gases as 3.5%. And finally, superheated or dry steam is defined as steam existing at a temperature greater than the boiling point temperature corresponding to its pressure or saturation temperature. And it also results in suboptimal steam sterilization conditions. SD79 tells us that superheat in excess of 25 degrees Celsius is not acceptable. So remember earlier we said that saturated steam, our sterilant, needs to condense on instrument surfaces. And those non-condensable gases in the steam supply can prevent uniform and effective condensation, resulting in inadequate sterilization conditions. So non-condensable gases, or NCGs, is a really fancy term, and it's actually something very common. What do you think the most common non-condensable gas is? It's air that is somehow leaking in. And potential sources of non-condensable gases include inadequate air removal in the sterilizer itself, air leaking in through the sterilizer valves or gases. It might be gases entrapped in the supplied steam, or maybe the boiler water hasn't been adequately de-aerated before going into the boiler. So while our critical variables are time, temperature, and the presence of saturated steam, think of air as the enemy. 
and methods of steam sterilization have in common that they have a method of getting the air out of the chamber and load items during the conditioning phase of the cycle. Many sterilizers have multiple types of air removal built into the sterilizer. For example, you might have a gravity cycle. And in a gravity cycle, steam is pumped into the top of the chamber, driving air out the chamber drain. Or on that same vessel, you may have dynamic air removal cycles. Dynamic air removal is an umbrella term, and it includes both pre-vacuum sterilizers, where a series of vacuum pulls and pressure pulses are used to very effectively remove the air from the chamber, or steam flush pressure pulse chambers, which also have a series of positive steam pulses and then gravity flushes to effectively remove the air, but they never pull the pressure below atmospheric pressure. So we'll dig into each of these methods. Here's a graphic representation of a gravity displacement cycle. The dotted line represents atmospheric pressure, and the graph shows pressure, the blue line, as a function of time during the sterilization cycle. After you press that start button in a gravity displacement sterilizer, incoming steam displaces the air through a drain near the bottom of the sterilizer. This happens during the conditioning or comment time of the sterilization cycle. Then when the temperature sensor in the drain determines that it's reached the preselected cycle temperature, the drain closes and the exposure phase begins. This is a sterilization phase. And finally, that cycle finishes, of course, with a drying phase. So contrast that image with this profile of a pre-vacuum cycle. The blue line again shows chamber pressure as a function of time during the come up phase and the sterilization phase and the drying fine. And then that dotted line represents atmospheric pressure. So you can see that during the come up or conditioning phase, air is mechanically removed by a vacuum system. There's a series of steam injections followed by vacuum pulls that go below atmospheric pressure. And then during exposure phase, the drain closes and we keep that pressure and the load items at the specified exposure temperature. And finally, a drying phase ensures that our load contents are dried and the chambers return to atmospheric pressure so the door can be opened. This slide depicts a typical steam flush pressure pulse cycle. The green line is the temperature and the purple line is the pressure as a function of time. Note that those steam flushes happen during the conditioning phase all above atmospheric pressure. Many tabletop sterilizers now employ steam flush pressure pulse cycles as it offers a more efficient method of air removal than a simple gravity cycle that previously was used in steam sterilizers, in, in tabletop sterilizers. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about tabletop sterilizers because they're an essential piece of equipment in many office-based medical and dental pra practices and some small ambulatory surgery centers as well. Your facility may have a sterilizer similar to one of those on the screen, maybe at a clinic or physician office that's affiliated with your practice or with your hospital. Amy defines tabletop sterilizers as compact steam sterilizers having a chamber volume of not more than two cubic feet that generate their own steam when distilled or deionized water is added by the user. So that's in contrast to the larger in-wall sterilizers that you may have in your hospital or larger ASCs that are connected to a facility boiler system or have a dedicated external boiler supplying the steam. Let's move on and talk about another term, IUSS, or immediate use steam sterilization. Uh, this, of course, is a process designed for the steam sterilization of patient care items for immediate use. You know, originally IUSS was used to reprocess dropped instruments mid-procedure using the unwrapped method and typically a 270 Fahrenheit gravity cycle. It was called high temperature sterilization, and that's because it was typically only used at 270 in the OR. However, over the last 10 years or so, we've seen a real transition to the use of pre-vacuum sterilizers as immediate use sterilizers 
in the operating room. And we've also seen a transition, of course, from an open pan method of sterilization to the use of closed containers. I really want to stress that immediate use should be used only in urgent clinical situations. There's little or no dry time, so the items are going to be wet after sterilization. And items should be placed in a container that's FDA cleared for the cycle parameters that are going to be used. It could be either a gravity displacement or a dynamic air removal cycle. Probably the most critical issue related to safely reprocessing instruments is to know if you're running the correct sterilization cycle for the medical devices you're processing. But how do you determine which process to run? And if, even if you know it's steam, you need to know the correct method of air removal, exposure time, and exposure temperature to use. And if an accreditation surveyor asks you, how do you know what cycle to run? I want to hear you all saying, I check the IFU. You've checked that manufacturer's IFU because the manufacturer is responsible for validating the sterilization parameters of devices that they sell. And while the manufacturer has the responsibility to provide cleaning and sterilization instructions to you, it's the responsibility of the healthcare facility to obtain those instructions and follow them for cleaning, running the right cycle type, exposure time and temperature, and dry time. And the IFUs, of course, should be accessible to the frontline staff performing device reprocessing. I recognize that this is a stink stinky but necessary responsibility, and it can involve a lot of legwork chasing down the information. Many facilities subscribe to an online repository, such as onesourcedocs.com, to facilitate staff access to current IFUs. Note that both Amy and ARN recommend that if the device, sterilizer, and packaging manufacturer's IFUs conflict, the device manufacturer's IFU should be followed. So, with that background setting the stage, we'll move on to our first learning objective and review the quality control recommendations that Amy and Erwin provide us. The information in this session is derived from two main resources, Erwin's 2020 edition of their Guidelines for Perioperative Practice. So, in preparation for this, I went through and made sure that all the references were in the new 2020 edition, and there were some subtle changes in wording. And then also Amy SD79, which of course was published in 2017. The good news is that these two resources continue to be very consistent in their guidance around steam sterilization monitoring. So when you're working with your colleagues between the OR and Central Sterile, um, there should be consensus about monitoring practices. And while this session focuses on quality control for steam sterilization, I just had to mention the importance of cleaning. Effective sterilization is absolutely dependent on meticulous cleaning. So here's a shout out to anybody who pulled a shift in decontam this week. Thank you for your critical work. Cleaning can be improved when it is verified. So just like there's quality control for sterilization, there is recommended verification from both Amy and Erwin for cleaning. Erwin says that both manual and, and mechanical cleaning should be monitored. And when you're testing your mechanical cleaners, it should be when they're newly installed, at least weekly, but preferably daily, after major repairs, and after significant changes in cleaning parameters, like maybe you switch cleaning solutions. And you should also evaluate manual cleaning using objective measurements. And of course, you would choose instruments that are very difficult to clean when you're using those objective measures. There are cleaning verification also in, provided in Amy SB79. Amy tells us that mechanical equipment should be verified. And they provide a few different methods. You can directly taste 
test individual instruments for residual soil. And you could use that, for example, using an ATP test or a protein test or a hemoglobin test. You might employ a test device that rides with the instruments through the automated cleaner. And you'll also will, of course, check the printout on the mechanical cleaner. The frequency recommended in SD79 is upon installation and then each day that the washer is used. And of course, after any major repairs are done, you'd also want to do testing. So we established earlier that the OR team only wants sterile instruments on the sterile field. And it's your responsibility to deliver those sterile items. Now, sterile is an absolute term, and it's defined as the absence of all living microorganisms. But unfortunately, the sterile condition cannot be easily observed or inspected. As part of your quality control program, you therefore use a suite of monitoring tools to gather information about the process and to demonstrate it was effective. And I'm sorry, this slide looks a little messed up here. But these tools that are in your toolbox include biological indicators, chemical indicators, and physical monitors. Amy SD79 has lots of detail about a quality control program, and it describes four levels of testing. Today, we're gonna to focus on the top three that are commonly performed. A routine load release, making sure that everybody who runs a sterilizer understands that they are making a conscious decision about whether or not to release those load items for use in patient care. And then there's routine efficacy monitoring. What's my regular pattern of testing each sterilizer to make sure it's working properly? Qualification testing. If anyone's lucky enough to have a new sterilizer on order, or perhaps had to have a major repair, to their existing sterilizer, you'd have to perform qualification testing before you use it to process items for patient use. And that fourth element, which we're not gonna dig into today, I just wanted to briefly mention is product testing. So that's testing of routinely processed items to ensure the effectiveness of the sterilization process in your sterilizer with your steam quality. As part of this testing, you also check to make sure the items are dry after the cycle. It's not widely done, but we do talk to some customers who perform product testing. And particularly, they tell us they do that when a, say, dense loner set that just makes them a bit nervous might show up. So let's talk first about that first level of testing, routine load release, and first for non-implant loads. We use a variety of our monitoring tools, and it's an active decision. You make that decision about releasing the load based on the physical monitors, the type one process indicator that's on every package. You place an internal chemical indicator inside every package. And if you like, you can use a process challenge device or PCD containing a BI or a BI in a type five CI or only a chemical indicator, either type five or type six, then all that data is evaluated by an experienced person. If anything indicates it's a problem, then we fall back on, if in doubt, throw it out. And we declare we have a sterilization process failure, investigate what's going on, and reprocess those load items. By physical monitors, we mean the printer tapes or digital information that's provided on the sterilizer interface. That physical monitor should be checked for every cycle to verify that the correct cycle was selected and that the sterilization parameters were met. And Amy does say that only sterilizers with recording devices should be used. So you could have either a printout or perhaps you've got a, a USB thumb drive that you could download the data. I mentioned this because um, there are some tabletop sterilizers that don't have this ability. So that would be an opportunity for improvement in some clinic settings. Exposure indicators are those external chemical indicators 
used to visually confirm that the package was exposed to steam. Every packaged item should have an external process indicator, unless, of course, like a peel pouch, you can see the internal chemical indicator. These indicators are not very um, sophisticated, and they don't provide us with information about the quality of the sterilization process, but they sure do help prevent accidental use of non-processed items. And we do hear stories about every six months about um, events in various facilities where non-processed items somehow make it onto the sterile field. Speaking of the sterile field, staff in the OR is checking an internal indicator, at least one, that's placed inside every package. SD79 now recommends the preferred use of a type 5 or type 6 indicator. Type 6 emulating indicators are labeled for specific cycles, while type 5 integrating indicators typically have broader indications for use, so most facilities find them to be the most practical choice. For those of you that work in the OR, ARN says that the internal chemical indicator should be read and interpreted before the trayer item is placed on the sterile field. If a pass result hasn't been achieved, you would reject the tray and never place those items on the sterile field. According to the FDA, an implant is defined as a device that's placed into a naturally formed or surgically created cavity of the human body and intended to remain there for at least 30 days. The CDC, AMI, and ARN all place a higher burden of quality control on steam sterilization cycles that contain an implantable device, with the rationale, of course, being that that implant presents a higher level of risk of infection to the patient. So what's different when we're releasing implant loads Amy recommends including a process challenge device, or PCD, that contains both a biological indicator and a type 5 integrating indicator, and that load should be quarantined until the results of the BI testing are available. The type 5 integrator is recommended that in the event you have a true emergency and need to release that implant earlier, you could do so based on the results of the type 5 integrator. It's better than not having that information and the type 5 integrator, which integrates all the critical variables for steam sterilization and is required by ISO to take as long to reach its endpoint as it takes to kill spores in ideal saturated steam conditions, is a good surrogate in emergency conditions. Amy does provide us with a document to document when we make those exceptions because those should certainly be an exception and not the rule. So this is an Annex L, and it's a record to document um, premature release of implants. It has make room on the form to include the name of the implant, the name of the patient, the reason for premature release, and maybe a comment about what could have prevented it. These forms are a great source of data. If you're looking for a QC program, maybe if you're elective surgery volume is low right now, you're looking for some quality improvement programs, you might go back, look through the early releases, and see if there's some common themes that could be um, could have corrective action that could be implemented to prevent future recurrences. So that was load release, that concept of making a decision after every sterilization load. The next level of testing recommended in SD79 is routine sterilizer efficacy monitoring. How can you be confident that your sterilizers are work, working well? Amy divides routine monitoring into three sections based on the size or type of sterilization process. So as you're looking through SD79, be sure you're in the right section. For all steam sterilizers, Select a biological indicator containing spores of Geobacillus sterithymophilus. In addition, the BI should be indicated for use in the cycles that you run at your facility. And it's recommended that the BI is placed in a process challenge device, or PCD. How often do you do it? 
Routine efficacy testing should be done weekly, but preferably each day that the sterilizer is in use. So let's talk a little bit more about those PCDs. PCDs are defined as an item defined to constitute a defined resistant to the sterilization process and used to assess the performance of the process. A PCD can either be prenate, that is commercially assembled, or user assembled. If it's user assembled, that means that you make the process challenge device. For terminal loads and pre back IUSS, use a commercially available FDA cleared disposable process challenge device or the AMI 16 towel pack. For gravity IUSS and tabletop sterilizers, there are no pre made commercial disposable PCDs, so you'll have to make your own user assembled PCDs, as we'll see in the upcoming slides. Okay, so that first bucket in routine efficacy monitoring was sterilizers larger than two cubic feet. Again, the frequency of monitoring is the same, weekly, preferably daily, and you can use an AMI 16 towel pack, or as is commonly done here in the US, use an FDA cleared BI PCD. In fact, AMI SD79 now recommends the use of a commercially available PCD because they offer better consistency than user assembled test packs. That PCD is placed in a full load on the bottom shelf over the drain, and many sterilizers are able to perform multiple cycle types. Each cycle type that you use should be tested. I mentioned we've seen a transition to dynamic air removal, typically pre-vac, IUSS cycles. So in your OR, if you're running pre-vac IUSS, you would also use a commercially available pre-assembled BIPCD to do this testing. Only in IUSS, Amy says that it can be done in an empty chamber. So we see it going both ways. Some customers prefer to come in first thing in the morning, run their warm up cycle, then a Bowie Dick, then run a BIPCD in an empty chamber because they don't know if they'll need to IUSS that day. Other facilities just run a BIPCD in the first IUSS load each day. Both are acceptable. For gravity displacement sterilizers, the end user should make a representative PCD. So for those of you who are doing gravity IUSS, you would use an individual or loose BI along with a type 5 integrator probably place it in the type of container you're using for IUSS, and that is your test pack. That test pack is placed on the bottom shelf over the drain in an otherwise empty chamber. And if you use multiple types of container, you want to do this testing with each type. And that takes us to tabletop sterilizers. That's the third bucket in FD79, frequency again, weekly, preferably daily. In the case of tabletop sterilizers, pre-assembled test packs are not available. And so the end user creates a representative PCD. If you look at the pictures on the bottom of the slide, if you're peel pouching items, you'd make that representative PCD by putting the BI and a type 5 integrator in a peel pouch. Call that the PCD. If you're doing wrapped items, you'd make up a dummy wrapped item by putting the BI and the integrator wrapping it, labeling it as a test pack. Those items are placed in the cold point of the sterilizer. And with tabletop sterilizers, you really should check with the manufacturer to see where that is. In some models, it's um, towards the front, towards the door, towards the bottom. And on the topic of tabletop sterilizers, in case any of you have responsibility for sterilizations in the clinics that might be affiliated with your system, I wanted to share this slide. Have you guys heard of ECRI? They're kind of like the Consumer Reports for Health Care. And late last year, this is pre-COVID, ECRI published their annual list of the top 10 technology hazards for 2020. At 3M, we often hear from customers in small clinics who aren't quite sure how to go about their sterilization monitoring. 
but we were still a little surprised to see that infection risks from sterile processing errors in medical and dental clinics made it onto ECRI's 2020 list. So if you haven't already, please reach out to the staff in your clinics to see if they need help with device reprocessing policies and procedures. Okay, back to monitoring. With any BI test system, it's necessary to run a positive control biological indicator to make sure the system is working well. So that positive control BI is taken directly from the box. It's not sterilized. You're testing to make sure the spores are still viable. The positive BI should be from the same lot as the test file. And this detail, as you all probably know, is something that Joint Commission surveyors love to check. It's the same lot number used for both the test and control BIs. ST79 asks us to do a control BI each day and in each autoreader or incubator. And the purpose of running that control is to make sure the incubation conditions are appropriate, make sure the organisms or the sterthmophilus spores in that BI are still viable, make sure the media is able to support growth, and to make sure that the incubator is working at the right temperature. Earlier, I talked about the challenge that those non-condensable gases, typically air, present to achieving sterilization. So we do a special test every day to make sure a sterilizer vacuum system is working well. For dynamic air removal steam sterilizers, routine efficacy testing includes the daily use of a Bowie Dick test. That Bowie Dick test, of course, is performed in an empty chamber before the sterilizer is used, so before the first process load. And we're looking for a nice uniform test sheet indicating that air removal was good and steam penetration was adequate. I also wanted to mention traceability. Amy SD79 recommends that each item be labeled with a lot control identifier prior to sterilization. This allows items to be identified or retrieved in the event you ever had a sterilization process recall or failure and need to execute a recall. Items processed for immediate use should also include a patient identifier. And items that are going to be stored for later use, of course, should have either an expiration statement for those facilities using an event-related shelf life system or an expiration date if you use a time-related shelf life system. ARN guidelines say that electronic instrument tracking systems may be used. SD79 provides us with guidance on when to execute a recall. So if anything in your QC monitoring, including a positive biological indicator, a failed physical monitor, or a failed chemical indicator in a process challenge device indicates a problem with the load, the facility should begin an investigation. If the cause of failure is figured out right away, typically we just correct that issue and reprocess that load. But if the cause of failure is not immediately identified, then you have to execute a recall back to the last biological indicator, last negative BI result. So in SD79, the recommended frequency for testing steam sterilizers is weekly, preferably daily. However, many of our customers, many of you out there listening, probably monitor more frequently. Indeed, about half of U.S. hospitals monitor every single steam sterilization load with a biological indicator in a process challenge device. So this is really considered a best practice. And when we ask end users, hey, why are you doing that? Why are you going above and beyond? They tell us they want to provide a uniform standard of care to all their patients. They want the highest level of a quality control in their facility. They're concerned that some implants might get missed. So to reduce the risk of monitoring mistakes, they just tell their staff to run a BIPCD on every cycle. And this really simplifies staff training. And I mentioned, if you ever have a positive BI or a failed chemical indicator in a test pack, you'd have to recall back to the last negative BI. So monitoring every cycle minimizes the impact of a recall. 
And finally, with the wide availability of biological indicators with very rapid results, people tell us, hey, it's just a no-brainer to monitor more frequently. So that takes us to our next learning objective, which is to discuss troubleshooting steam sterilization process failures. I really hope you don't have to do this soon, but in case you do, I thought that walking through a couple of case studies would be worthwhile. At the beginning of the session, we talked about your role in breaking that disease transmission cycle by performing cleaning and sterilization of reusable instruments. And while most days have successful outcomes, you know through experience that sterilization is complex. Various factors, including human error, equipment malfunction, and variabilities in utility or steam supply can lead to inconsistent practices and sterilization process failures. And that is why we have to use all the monitoring tools to monitor the effectiveness of the sterilization process. And when those tools indicate a problem, it's time to troubleshoot. As I mentioned, a failure can be detected multiple ways and any evidence of failure is enough to trigger an investigation into that failure. So it might be a failed physical monitor, it might be a positive BI from your test pack, or it might be a failed chemical indicator from a test pack. AORN recommends taking immediate corrective action in the event of a sterilization failure. And Amy SP79 has some great resources to help us with troubleshooting. Specifically, figure 10, I really like. It's a decision tree to help you conduct an investigation. And then in table four, there's a checklist to help identify some reasons. So if, for example, you're having a discussion with your facilities engineer, it's nice to be able to go through that checklist and say, hey, have we thought about this? Have you thought about that? What about those steam traps? So the decision tree tells us if a failure is indicated, our steps are quarantine that load, take the sterilizer out of service, and investigate the cause of failure. Here at 3M, we have a um, tech service team based in St. Paul, Minnesota, that answers the phone. And we also have a, a, a whole group of clinical specialists across the country who also help customers troubleshoot sterilization process failures. So today I wanted to review a few case studies as learning exercise. Here's our first case study. It was a sterilization process failure indicated by a positive biological indicator. So at this facility, it was an IUSS cycle where they had a problem. They do pre-vac IUSS, as we're finding is more and more common. And they did use a pre-assembled PCD to test their sterilizers. We asked them to check the printout. They said, yep, we ran that 274 minute cycle, just like we intended to. The items were in a rigid container. Earlier that day, they'd done a daily Bowie dick test and a BIPCD in an empty load, and both were successful. And they just mentioned in passing that, hey, we recently switched to every load monitoring. So you don't have enough information, but I'd like you to think about the scenario. Maybe if you've got a scratch pad or a post-it note, what do you think was the cause of the problem? Might it have been that the steam was too dry? Did a sterilizer valve need to be rebuilt? Could it be operator error? Or perhaps that chamber drain screen in the IUSS sterilizer was blocked and needed to be cleaned out. What do you guys think? Well, in this scenario, the answer was C, operator error. And what happened? Well, that Bowie Dick test and the daily BI test first thing in the morning had been done, as intended, on a pre-vacuum sterilizer the actual IUSS loading question was mistakenly run on a gravity cycle. This case study illustrates that human error is a common cause of sterilization process failures, and that monitoring every load with a BI and a PCD can help to catch these errors. 
Well, this case study was about a specific situation. I want to share that we are asked to troubleshoot similar events, so gravity cycles being inadvertently run in the OR every month or so. Just last week, I received a sterilizer printout via text message, and it was from a hospital who had a positive BI in an IUSS cycle. And once again, by looking at the printout, we could tell that they'd run a gravity cycle. And to me, the worrisome thing is not that they used a gravity cycle with a monitoring product indicated for pre-vacuum, but that they used a gravity cycle, which has less efficient air removal, unintentionally to process a medical device that had been validated for a pre-vacuum system. So in this case, the reason for the failure was immediately identified. They'd figured out, hey, just somebody uh, selected the wrong cycle. In that case, you would correct the situation, probably have a little bit of staff education, and reprocess that load item. So let's move to our next case study. This was a large facility. They were experiencing sporadic positive biological indicators. And they had a bank of four pre-vacuum sterilizers, but it was just in one that they were having problems. They were using the same lot of biological indicators in all of the sterilizers. Again, we checked the printout and the sterilization parameters seemed to have been met. We reviewed the placement of the biological indicator, and it was on the bottom shelf over the drain, right where it should be. Facility checked with their facility engineers, and they confirmed that they hadn't done any changes to the boiler or the steam supply. So I'd like you guys to think about it. What do you think was going on? Again, we've got four options. You can write your answer down on your scratch pad. And again, it typically boils down to, was it an operator issue? Was it a problem with the utilities? Was it a problem with the equipment? In this scenario, it was indeed the equipment. The service tech had to come. In fact, they had to come a couple of times, if I recall. They replaced a valve and a gasket, and that resolved the issue of residual air in the chamber. And when that tech left, he said, hey, that was a major repair. I recommend that you do qualification testing. So in that decision tree, there's a section that says, if you don't immediately identify the cause, then, as I said, you would quarantine the load, recall all last items, all processed items back to the last negative BI, and take the sterilizer out of service until you determine the cause of failure. If it was a minor repair, you could just return the sterilizer to service, but if it was a major repair, as in this case, then it's necessary to requalify the sterilizer. And talking about qualification testing, we'll just review this briefly because it's not a common event and it's well laid out in section 10.8 of Amy ST79. Again, it's divided into those three types of sterilizers. So if you have a sterilizer larger than two cubic feet, you'd run three consecutive BI PCDs in an empty chamber. Each should yield negative BIs. And then if it's a dynamic air removal cycle sterilizer, you'd follow that with three consecutive Bowie Dick test sheets each of which, of course, should yield passing results. In tabletop sterilizers, it's typical to run three BI PCDs in a full load. So again, three consecutive cycles, and you'd have to quarantine all those load items from those full loads until you got negative results for all of the BIs. And for IUSS sterilizers, three consecutive BI PCDs in an empty chamber. And if you have a pre-vac IUSS, you, of course, have to do the Bowie Dick testing as well. Here's our final case study. And this involves, it's a little bit different, it's a missing chemical indicator. So I said, the guys in the OR, your team in the OR, they are checking those load items before they put items on the sterile field for the internal chemical indicator. But in this case, the OR found that a type 5 integrator was missing on the middle level of a multi-level set. There were integrators on two of the other levels, both the top and bottom, and they were acceptable. So their facility policy addressed a failing CI, but not a missing CI. So 
and wondering how you would handle this in your facility and do you have a provision in your policy and procedure for this situation? There's probably um, no right answer, but a couple of the situations we've heard about how customers thought they would address that. Some people say, I'm going to use that set. Two of the CIs were acceptable. Other people said, we're going to reject that entire set and locate replacement instruments. One facility who contacted us about this exact situation, their response was to immediately sterilize just that middle layer of the set. And another facility that had the same situation, they decided to IUSS the entire set. So I'd like you to just think about, is this something that you might need to visit in your policies and procedures so that there wouldn't be a, a kerfuffle and staff would all agree about how to handle the situation, knowing that we really want to reduce the incidence of IUSS. So the key learnings from this session, I'd really like to thank you for working on the front lines in healthcare facilities, particularly during these trying times during our epidemic. The work that you guys do, cleaning and steam sterilizing reusable instruments, truly plays a critical role in patient safety and helps prevent surgical site infections by breaking that chain of infection. The critical nature of this work is evident as accreditation surveyors continue to focus on device reprocessing when they visit hospitals. And quality control monitoring, which should be done according to current evidence-based guidelines, is an important element of your steam sterilization process. And there's no need for you to dream up your own QC plan. We're really fortunate that we have consistent guidance provided in AMI SD79 and AORN guidelines. And finally, should you be working the night shift and encounter evidence of a failed steam sterilization cycle, I'm hoping you'll remember that there's nice troubleshooting resources included in SD79 that can help you begin your investigation. And with that, I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Susan, for taking our audience through all things steam sterilization. We do have a couple of quick questions that came through. Uh, the first question is, is annual revalidation of all steam sterilizers a standard protocol, even though you've done routine monitoring every time and there was no problem with the sterilizer? Well, I would ask you to refer to your sterilizer manufacturers operator's manual and make sure that you're following the preventative maintenance prescribed in that manual. It is not typical in the U.S. for hospitals to revalidate their steam sterilizers. It is typical to follow the guidance provided in ST79, uh, which includes the monitoring program as we discussed today, and then to make sure also that they're following the preventative maintenance guideline recommended by the sterilizer manufacturer. Thank you for that. The next question is, can I use the sterilizer that passes a belly dick in a biological indicator test but failed vacuum test? Oh, great question. Yeah, and so um, that vacuum or leak test that's performed, again, according to what your sterilizer manufacturer recommends, um, I would not use a sterilizer. So even if you're getting negative BIs and a passing belly dick, if you're failing the leak test as prescribed in the manufacturer's operator's manual, I would not use that vessel. I'd be calling for preventative maintenance on that sterilizer. All right, and final question, is the vacuum test not necessary as part of routine qualification in steam sterilization? Again, it's not called out in Amy ST79, but perhaps in the brand of sterilizer that you have, they do recommend it as part of qualifying that vessel. So um, um, it's, it's really important to have the operator's manual on hand, not just for all the instruments that you're sterilizing, but also for the equipment that you have. And that includes the sterilizers. It should be readily available. And if it recommends doing a leak test as part of sterilizer qualification, then I would certainly include that. And um, I apologize. Next time, maybe I'll mention that. 
All right, and one more question. To test the sterilizer after a major repair, it's recommended to run three BIs and three DART tests. Why is the order opposite of the daily test where you first run a DART test and then a BI? That's a great question. And you know, that comes up after every seminar. The order did used to be the same as the daily testing. It was flipped in Amy SD79. And truly from a scientific point of view, I don't think it matters. But I do like now that for qualification testing, doing that BI testing first allows you to get those BIs incubating. So by the time you to finish your Bowie Dick testing, you'll probably have the results from the biological indicators and your sterilizer will be good to go. So I think it's just a, a more efficient way of tackling that testing. Whereas on our daily testing, because we wanna make sure that vacuum system is working well before we process any goods for patient use, that's why the Bowie Dick test is first. And of course, it's typical that folks are including a BI test pack in that first full load of the day, if not in every single load. All right. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, everyone, who submitted a question today. And Susan, thank you so much for your presentation. I do want to play a promotional video from 3M. They will be giving a, an exciting product announcement. So please tune in. Hello everybody and today I'm just really excited to bring to you an update from 3M. My name is Mary Rose Till and I am the Central Serialization Solutions Marketer at 3M and today we're just going to go over some new things that we have in store for you. I know it's been pretty crazy, uh, crazy time for us but for the serialization team at 3M we've been, we've been moving forward, staying focused, keeping our eye on the ball and we actually have some new products to announce so we're actually going to go through that right now. And it's two new products that we'll talk about today. One is the 3M A-Test Mini Auto Reader 490M, our mini. And then the other is the 3M A-Test Steam Chemical Indicator 1243A, 1243B, 1243RE, the extender version. So let's jump in and just talk about some of those benefits for these new products. So first off, our 3M A-Test Steam Chemical Integrator, our 1243A, 1243B, and our 1243RE, is about to launch. We're scheduled to launch both of these products in June. And some of the benefits is, as you can see, it's easy to see. It's different color than the, the old stereo gauge product. This is going to be uh, replacing our stereo gauge product that you might be familiar of. It's that um, teal and um, like light white uh, color. This is replacing that one with the steam chemical integrator. You can see it's the red and green. It's really the easiest to see and it's the easiest to read with our vibrant colors and the way we've positioned it. It's also enhanced efficiency. So simply scan the barcode to upload any information to your hospital and to your tracking system. So that's an added feature. Convenient results. So the moving front technology there eliminates time spent interpreting color changes. And it's durable material, so the thick aluminum foil is made to withstand the extremes of steam sterilization. This is to support, maybe you know, you've know you had some leakers in your department. This is uh, to, to address that complaint and that quality concern there. So we're super excited to be launching this product. We actually have been testing it out in the market and getting everybody's feedback. And the results I'd like to share with you is, uh, actually, three and four OR professionals agree that the 3M A-Test Steam Chemical Integrator Type 5 are visually easier to, to find in the trays than competitive brands. I did cite that, that information there on the left there. So as you can see, in comparison with our old Comply Stereo Gauge and Gedinga and the Steris Steam Chemical Integrator, compared to those other products, including ourselves, this one wins three and four OR Professionals agree that this is easier to find and easier to read. And the results also stated that 66% say that it's the easiest to read and easiest to find. So of those OR professionals, they say the sterilization results are the easiest to read on the 3M ATIS steam chemical integrators compared to those competitive products that I mentioned, including ourselves, 3M Comply, Siri Gauge, the Steris, chemical integrator and Gedinga as well. 
Next up, I want to show our ATEST Mini Autorator 490M, our Mini. Here you can see that uh, it's, it's got a different look and feel, of course, and it's much smaller. And it's part to raise the standard of care to help protect patients from the risk of infection with every load monitoring with fast 24 minute BI results. It's possible with this little guy, it's, it includes our 1491 biological indicator for STEAM and on addition, our 1492 for STEAM biological indicator, something you're very familiar with. In addition, you can also put the hydrogen peroxide biological indicator in there, that's 1295. It's also uh, available and compliant in any well of the reader at the same time. So that's great. Uh, another feature is being connected. So you connect with 3M product apps that you're already using to get the real-time biological indicator results and quickly integrate your data into your facility's tracking system. And another great feature for your central sterilization facilities and your hospitals, the two size option. So you might be familiar with our other uh, 490 auto reader. It's a little larger. This one's half the size and half the price. So two size options enable you to standardize your practice across multiple facilities for efficient and training use. So think about, you know, where else you could put this mini, uh, maybe it's in your OR, maybe, uh, Maybe your facility specifically does have some small surgery centers or dental offices uh, that are under the same umbrella or IDNs. This, is, this makes it really easy to have efficiency and training across the board. And if you're wondering how many, how many is many, I put this up here too. So you can see that the mini auto reader is, is essentially pocket size. Uh, so you can take it really anywhere, but you really have to have a plug-in. But uh, the, the iPhone, it's, it's the same size as the iPhone 10. So uh, pretty exciting. We're excited to launch this. Uh, also has a June scheduled launch for now. And then I also just want to talk about two new educational programs that are offered to you as a 3M customer. Uh, you can be talking to your 3M sales representatives, the sales account managers about these two programs. The first one is our 3M Peak Clinical Out Outcomes Program. And what this is, is designed to just position uh, you and, and ourselves, 3M, as a, a partner in this fight against, you know, doing the best that we can for our patients. So it's designed to identify the areas where you have the biggest opportunity to drive impact at your facility. So we have different types of tools and assessments to look over that. And then we also have it separated to just learn more about best practices, clinical evidence and new ways to improve uh, outcomes. And then under the improve, it's, you know, again, different assessment tools that you can work with our 3M account managers to implement into making you know, a new work process and flow that's efficient and it's aligned with protocols through a variety of different tools that we're offering. And then it's also designed to just keep it up and maintain that, that progress you've made that we've identified with you. So this is type of a partnership program to go to the, the highest level of standard of care and making sure that your, uh, your departments are as efficient and as up to date and work well with the current protocols that are in place. So a couple of those uh, new tools that we're launching in the central sterilization are the process assessment tool. So basically that's a walkthrough for, through your facility. And it just shows where the, uh, the match with the guidelines and looking at AMI standards, both ST79 and ST58. So it's going through and doing kind of like a guidance check through your department. And also the self-assessment tool is easy and handy tool to just check where you're at as far as education and you know if maybe you need a little bit more education in, in the steam or hydrogen peroxide it's a simple uh, little quiz that shows you where where there's gaps so these are all things to try and help you as a central sterilization professional be do the best that you possibly can in an easy and effective way the other thing i want to talk about about is our 3M SterileU educational program. SterileU has been something that we've done for years and years, but we've just given a new face, especially on a digital front. So you'll see the sterilization reference guide that we, we put on go.3m.com slash SterileU. And that is gonna show a bunch of different areas around you know, different webinars that are readily available and you can access and get free CEs, all powered by 3M Healthcare Academy. 
So you can watch current and upcoming live webinars to earn your CE credits. Or you can earn, like I said, those CE credits through our educational track series. So we've customized some tracks. Maybe you're a new tech professional and you need just the basics of serialization. We have a customized track for that. Or maybe you've, you've been in the field for a long time and you want some leadership development. We have some CE credits that offer that as well. Different type of tracks to fit your needs. We also have a function in, on that platform where you can request an educational speaker or an event from 3M. So that would be routed right into 3M. We'll look at what, what exactly you need and we can come in and host an event or provide an educational speaker if it makes sense. And then we have you know, loads of other tips and tricks of the trade that are actually from peers. So we've, we've partnered with some of our customers in the field, some industry leaders and they've just offered more insight. So all of these things are on there. Please just go down to go.3m.com slash sterile You can see that URL there to find out more information. And that concludes my update. So for any further information, whether it be the new products, the mini auto reader or the steam chemical integrator, you can contact your local 3M account manager or you can use that 1-800 number or that email address that I have on the screen as well. But just know that we're always here to support you. We thank you for all the hard work that you do and have a great day. All right, everybody. If Hank Bulch were a star, he'd be a rock star. And in a few short minutes, he'll be headlining this Beyond Clean virtual conference and rounding out an exciting Friday afternoon. So we will see you all shortly.